Up next, Gordon and I take a look at the Fujifilm X100F on the Camera Labs Photography Podcast. Hi, this is Doug Kay. I'm here with Mr. Camera Labs, Gordon Lang, to talk about the Fujifilm X100F. Hello, Gordon. Hello, Doug. How are you? It feels like only last week that I saw you. It does feel that way. You know why? Because it was, only, it was only last week that I saw you. Yay. In a previous episode of the Camera Labs Photography Podcast, I promised that I would take one of your very generous coffee donations and buy Doug a coffee. This involved flying out to San Francisco, but, you know, I'm true to my word, so I did that and I bought Doug a coffee. In fact, did I... Did I buy you two? You did buy me two. I mean, if you're going to come all the way from Brighton to San Francisco, you might as well buy a second cup. And you did. Exactly. Blue bottle, wasn't it? That was that San Francisco, uh, San Francisco yes, we, coffee. We had, we had a blue bottle. We did. It was very, yeah. good. very yeah. good. Thank you. Very nice it is, too. So that proves how honest I am. So if you buy Doug or I a coffee and there's a link directly below this video or if you're watching this on the Camera Labs website, there's links all over the place. If you like what Doug and I do, you can buy us a coffee and it really helps what we do. Again, also, if you want to get the T-shirt, the book behind me, or if you're ever shopping for anything at Amazon, B&H, Rider Armor, click through those links. It doesn't matter what you're buying. Underpants, cameras. I just like saying underpants. Uh, maybe <laughs> yeah, buy more underpants. Maybe I need to do underpants.com. Uh, some sort of underwear review sign. Why do I think that already exists? Why do I think that? <laughs> should we move on? We should, but I want, you know, I want to say special thanks to everybody who does listen, uh, who subscribes to the audio, the video, reads the written reviews at cameralabs.com, and particularly those people who go to the trouble to give us a rating on iTunes or elsewhere, because we really appreciate it. And don't forget, look over the corner. I got to get, not only do I have my, my in-camera book from Gordon, but it's now signed. I am a very yeah. lucky person. All right, we yeah. won't waste any more time with this marvelous book. I love it. Gordon, tell me about the Fuji Film X100F. Okay, this is a fixed lens, high end compact for enthusiasts. It has an APS C sensor. It has a fixed lens. It's not a zoom uh, and it's fixed, so you can't change it. It's equivalent to 35 millimeter. And it's got a very cool viewfinder that gives an optical and an electronic view. Now, this is in fact the fourth in the series. You know, it's the fourth because the X100F, the F stands for fourth. So if we go back in time, the X100S was the second, the X100T was the third, F is the fourth. So what are they going to do for the fifth? Is it going to be the X100F2, the X200F? I guess it's the H. <laughs> I don't know. Do you know, do you know in, my, in my daftness, I only recently realized that uh, versions of Android are actually alphabetical suites. I did not know that. So you have like jelly bean and lollipop or whatever, uh, but they're actually sweet. So they're all kind of sweets or puddings, you know, like ice cream sandwich, but they're alphabetical. I got that. Yeah. No, I see, I, I got, kind of, I got the sweets, but I didn't get the alphabetical. Yeah. 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 So it's that's, that's quite clever. So I don't know what happens when they've done 26 of them. They have to invent a new operating system, but anyway. The good of vegetables. Exactly. Exactly. And, um, on a more serious note, as we'll discuss, while the X100F is a really nice camera and a good upgrade, actually, to the uh, X100T, it is a camera that I feel once it comes to a fifth generation, a new iteration, that perhaps there's a few things that they should change. And uh, we'll talk about that in the video. But first, Doug, how much are we looking at for this compact camera? The X100F here in the U.S. is $1,299. let us call it $1,300. Right. So that's not a, uh, a cheap point and shoot is it this is this is a compact camera that is uh, aimed at people who take their photography pretty seriously and also their budget fairly seriously now we're going to talk more about rivals towards the end of the show but just to kind of get this in a ballpark let's have a look at another high-end compact a uh, smaller one smaller sensor uh, one inch sensor the sony rx100 mark 5 that's their latest generation it's half the half the weight of the X100F, it's considerably smaller and it's got a lot of extra features I'll talk about. Uh, but how much are you looking at for that, Doug? Yeah, here's an example. This is the X, this is the RX100 Mark IV, which is physically about the same. Uh, and it's, the X100 Mark V is $1,000. So it is $300 cheaper than the Fujifilm X100F. Okay. Um, it's also, we're also going to uh, be describing the X100F as a kind of slightly more compact fixed lens version of the X Pro 2, which is one of Fujifilm's joint flagships. How much for an X Pro 2 body? Yeah, uh, well, X Pro 2, I don't have the body price. I have it with the with the 20 millimeter F2. It's a thousand dollars more. That's with the 23 millimeter F2. 23, 23 right. millimeter F2, right. A thousand dollars more. And uh, looking at the unbundled price of that lens, I'm going to guess that it's about 
Without the lens, it's probably about $550 more than the X100F without, without a lens. Yeah, so it's cheap compared to that. And it's also important to say it's cheap compared to, well, kind of really high-end fixed lens compacts. I mean, if you go to a Leica, you're going to be spending a lot more money. If you have, say, a Sony RX1, R Mark II, albeit a full frame uh, camera, that's much more expensive. So the S100F does sound quite expensive when you first describe it, but it's actually quite cheap compared to a lot of rivals. And there's 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 not a lot that is kind of comparable to it that has a fixed lens, an APS-C sensor, and a viewfinder. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna describe um, describe what it does. So I'm just gonna pop my uh, my drink down here. There we go. Now, I, as I said, I went out uh, to San Francisco the other week and met up with Doug and shot all day with the X100F and made sure that you had a go of it as well, Doug. So it's a camera you're familiar with as well. Have you tried the, the earlier iterations of this camera too? I have. I've, I've loved every one of them. Uh, and Fujifilm continues to make you know small improvements. It's still the same basic camera, uh, I guess, except for the viewfinder. Well, the kind of main difference, the main difference between the X100F and the X100T is that they've equipped it with the latest X-Trans 3 sensors. So it's jumped from 16 to 24 megapixels. But because it uses an embedded phase detect autofocus system that's embedded on the sensor, it also means that it gains uh, more sophisticated autofocus. Although, as I'll explain again later on, a lot of that is limited by the lens that's in front of it. But it does gain that broader phase detect AF area, the high resolution sensor. So it's essentially delivering the same image quality taking the lens into consideration though the same sensor quality as the xt2 the x pro 2 and the xt20 so it is the the latest uh, version of uh, fujifilm sensor and it's also important to note that it's the smallest camera which has this sensor in it fujifilm also has an x70 camera which is their aps-c fixed lens 28 mil uh, but without a viewfinder and of course the first question this would beg is is there going to be an X80 with an X-Trans 3? I would really like to see that. I believe, however, it's not possible. This is not absolutely confirmed. I personally believe from conversations I've had that it's going to be difficult, if not impossible, due to power requirements, that the battery in the X70 is simply too small for the X-Trans 3. And there could also be some heat considerations as well. So don't expect to see an X80 with an X-Trans 3 sensor. Um, so if you're after the smallest body with the latest and greatest Fujifilm quality, then the X100F is it. So we're going to look at the actual uh, body itself now. Before going any further, I want to show you a photo that I took because I was reviewing the X100F at the same time as the uh, Panasonic GX800, GX850, which is a micro four thirds camera, but it's an interchangeable lens camera, right? And you may naturally assume that because it's got interchangeable lenses and a lens mount, that the body's going to be bigger. But as you can see in this photo, the uh, the GX800 or GX850 is actually noticeably smaller and lighter than the X100F. I mean, the X100F is, is quite a chunky camera. It is not a pocket camera. It's not like Doug's RX100 series, which will just about squeeze in a pocket. This, you're looking at a coat pocket, really, or a small bag. I mean, it, it is still compact, but I just wanted to put it in perspective before anything else. You know, it is fairly fairly large i mean doug you've kind of carried it around what do you what do you think of it size wise well again the x100f is not a pocketable camera as you say it's sort of a typical non-removable lens non-zoom uh, street camera uh but there are you know there are uh, options now it, since it doesn't fit in a pocket really in a pants pocket then comparing it to the gx800 gx850 is perfectly reasonable i think yeah, which is another camera which won't fit in the pocket either because the lens does pr protrude too much. But, um, you know, it's just I think every time I every time I kind of think about the X100 series or read about it, I always imagine it's smaller than it actually is. And then when I get hold of one for review, I'm like, oh, look at that. That's, that's kind of bigger than I thought. So I just wanted to get that out of the way first, although it is still smaller than an X-T20 fitted with a 23 millimeter f2 lens which is something i know a lot of you will be thinking about and i'm going to make some comparisons throughout the review as to what each of those cameras can and can't do i mean just the kind of just a quick bottom line an xt20 with that lens fitted is twice the thickness so that's quite that's significantly thicker you know yeah. and it, by the way that that combination is the exact same price as the x100f so if you're interested in going with fuji interchangeable lens you can you can now you have a more difficult choice because they're exactly the same price. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a really interesting comparison to make. Um, 
you know, price wise, but I'll, I'll talk about the difference in features soon. OK, so let's have a look at the body and uh, and the controls on this camera. So if you have a look at it from the front, you'll see that it shares pretty much the same styling as its predecessors. You know, it's a fairly chunky but retro styled camera. I think it's a great looking camera. And it's one that when, I, when I'm writing my review of a camera, I like to have it on the desk in front of me and I kind of glance up at it lovingly or not lovingly as, as you know, depending on the design and how I feel. But when I'm out and about, um, writing, say, in cafes or libraries and things like that, you know, it's in public view. And some cameras, people just don't t give a second glance at. But the X100 series has always drawn admiring glances. Not people who want to nick it, but people who go, oh, I like your camera. Oh, I like the look of that. What's that? They're always very interested in it. And it's a camera that calls out to me, um, which I think is very important. We've talked about it before. You could have the best camera technically in the world, the best autofocus, the best quality. But if you look at it and you're like, oh, you know, do I want to pick it up and take it out? I don't know, like that. But the X100F, you look at it and you go, oh, look at that. It's lovely. I want to I want to use it. It calls out to me. That's a very personal thing. But it's a very important thing. If a camera calls out to you, you will take it out. You will use it. So good looking camera. You will notice just one, th two things of note, three things of note on the front. First is that big viewfinder window. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Second is what looks like, if you're as old as I am, uh, what looks like a old self-timer kind of switch. In the old days on film SLRs, you would actually have this um, kind of clockwork thing on the front, this lever. You go, <laughs> turn it around and let go. It goes, click. And that would be your self-timer. And it looks like it's got one of those on the front. But that's actually the switch that switches between the electronic and the optical viewfinder views. So that's quite nice that they've thrown in these old kind of retro cues the only other thing of note on the front the first difference physical difference between the f and the t model is there is now a front dial which wasn't on the t and in fact before the t there wasn't even one on the back so fujifilm have been piling controls onto this camera in the last couple of generations it's clickable like the one on the back like the xt20 it doesn't actually do that much and i'm hoping that it will be more configurable with maybe a firmware update in the future, but at least it's there. The, the hardware is there. And Fuji's got a good track record for uh, firmware updates. Now, as you look at the top of the camera, you will see, if you're familiar with the X-Pro2, the X100F really is like a kind of pocket version of this camera. It shares almost the same upper right panel. Um, as such, it's got a dedicated shutter release dial, but new to the X100F over the T before it is uh, an ISO control, which is kind of housed within the shutter dial. Again, this is a, a nod, a respectful nod back to old film SLRs. What you do is the outer kind of ring the outer shell, the outer barrel of the shutter release dial, you can pull it up, it's spring-loaded, and when you pull it up and turn it, it turns a dial within that. You can see within a little window on the top, and this lets you adjust the ISO. Like all Fujifilm cameras, uh, it has a position for uh, low and high sensitivities as well, even though there's two high sensitivity options which are choosing a menu. Why they can't find pos room for two H positions on the dial, I don't know, or just abandoned 51,200 ISO. I don't know. They've got to do one or the other because that annoys me. But that's, I'm probably the only person that that annoys. Um, but, Doug, do you remember those controls, those spring-loaded? You know what I'm yeah. talking about, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Although uh, I don't remember a film camera with an ASA adjustment. That would be pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, of course. It was something else it would adjust. No, yeah. no, no, it did because you had to set the film speed oh, in order oh, to – for, for uh, the meter. For the, for the metering. metering. Yes, yes, you're absolutely right trying to trick me I, playing I, well with actually i'm just you've just got up I'm, I'm just yeah that's true it's early here convincing you that my memory is basically gone and if it didn't happen later if it didn't happen previously this morning it didn't happen at all okay um exactly uh you will also notice that the exposure compensation dial go now goes between plus and minus three ev and it has a c position again this is shared on the x pro 2 and the xt2 this is where the front dial comes in. You position the exposure compensation dial to C, and you now get an expanded range of plus or minus 5 EV, and that is adjustable with that front dial. Um, and just to kind of reconfirm that, this is a camera that X-Pro2 owners might want as a kind of second camera. They've even rotated the position of the power switch, which is a collar around the shutter release. You'll see that it's a, a threaded cable release for, you know, again, old fart knockers like myself who've got old <laughs> style threaded cable releases. But you'll notice that the power switch is turned on it. 
uh, to match the X Pro 2. So this really is what they're trying to do. You have that kind of muscle memory, don't you, where you reach for certain controls. Well, you've now got that. If you're very familiar with the X Pro 2, you're going to use the X100F immediately. It's just going to make complete sense. And this extends when you go to the back of the body. And you'll notice, again, at first glance, it appears to be the same as the X100T, but put them next to each other. And you'll notice they've shifted the screen all the way to the left side to free up more space on the right for the AF joystick, or as they call it, the AF lever. I, don't know, I think a lever just goes left and right. I think right. if it goes up and down as well, it's a joystick, right? That's right. That's right. It's- Why would you call it a lever? <laughs> I don't know. I Do you agree know. with me? That I, oh, has sure. Position. Yeah. Hey, Gordon, anything yeah. you say is right. I'm, I'm, I'm going along with everything today. It is early for Doug. He's not, he's not <laughs> playing. So it has an AF joystick on the back, and this is a major, major, major upgrade for me. It still doesn't have a touch screen, but the AF joystick is fantastic, especially as you will, as we'll discuss in a minute, be mostly shooting with this through the viewfinder. And when you've got this camera up to your eye, the uh, AF joystick uh, falls naturally beneath your thumb as it does on the X-T2 and the X-Pro2, because that's where it came from. And it's just, it's really nice. It's so quick and easy to move the AF area. That for me is a major, major upgrade. So, I mean, these are, you know, the AF joystick, the ISO dial, the front control dial. These are the uh, the kind of new physical improvements over the previous model. And as I mentioned before, it also gets the new sensor. So these are the, these are the two kind of main areas that they've upgraded this. I want, I want to mention one thing. You know, a lot of our listeners, viewers, and readers may never have picked up a Fujifilm camera. And I, I think it's worth mentioning that that these cameras don't have a mode dial, right? This is, this is a different kind of camera. There's an aperture control, which is on the lens, but explain to people who haven't used a Fujifilm camera before why there's no mode dial. Okay, so they, they've gone for an approach... Uh, kind of, I guess you call it an old fashioned approach now rather than a traditional one, an older approach, again, from film SLRs back in the day and, and other cameras before that, where you instead of having instead of selecting, say, program aperture, shutter, priority or manual, you instead set the manual and the shutter speed separately. So you have a ring, as you say, around the lens, it's a fixed lens. So it, it has a nice, very clickable, very tactile, I should add. Uh, aperture ring on that in 30V increments, and you have a shut speed dial on the top. Now, if you have them both set to a number, then you're in manual mode. Both of these dials also have an A position for automatic. If you have them both set to A, the camera effectively becomes uh, in program mode. If you have the shutter dial set to A, and you turn the aperture ring manually, you're in aperture priority and vice versa. So if you have the aperture set to A, and you turn the shutter dial, you're in shutter priority. So they're the kind of, you see, you can access the same four ways of working, but it's just in a different way. Um, some people prefer it, some people don't. I think, Doug, I suspect from previous discussions that you actually really like this way of working, don't I, you? I like this a lot because if if you think of it the, the way we've become used to, which I think is uh, unnecessarily complicated, if you want to switch to aperture priority mode with a, a regular camera, you switch to aperture priority mode and then you still have to set the aperture. It's two separate controls. Same with shutter mm. priority. You have to say, mm. I want shutter priority and then set your shutter speed. Here, if you want aperture priority, you just dial in the aperture. You want shutter priority, you dial in the shutter speed. You want both, you just dial them in. So there's one step less to do in order to achieve the settings that you want and that's why i like and it's also they're honest if you look at them you can look at the lens it'll tell you what it is i have one of the sony 85 millimeter f1 4 g master lenses and it has a very nice aperture dial but you know if i put it into shutter priority that aperture ring is wrong i have to ignore it and that's annoying yeah I'm one of the few Sony lenses with an aperture ring, actually, yeah. that one. So, you know, it says I'm at f2.8, but I'm not because I'm in shutter priority mode. So Yeah. the um, As you say, that kind of honesty continues when the camera's switched off. You know what aperture and shutter speed it's going to be using as soon as it's switched on. Whereas when you switch off a PASM camera, you have no idea what it's going to power up at. It's going to power up with probably what you had it set to last, but you may not remember what that is. So that is nice. Now, the downside to this is that you, of course, don't have... Now, you do have all aperture settings on the aperture ring, but you don't have all shutter speeds on the shutter dial. They can't do it. They're in one EV increments, not third EV increments. And so the way you access the thirds... So, for example, it goes up to four thousandth of a second. The next one down is two thousandth of a second. So how do you access the ones in between it? You do it with the rear dial. So that's where it becomes a little awkward, I think. And similarly, if you go down to one second, that's the longest 
selectable shutter speed from the dial. If you want longer exposures, you've got to put it onto the T position and then use the rear dial to access those. And in fact, if you're feeling a little frustrated by it, you could just leave it on T and access the full shutter speed range from 4,000th down to, I think, 30 seconds with the uh, with the rear control. Or if you're using the electronic shutter, it would go all the way up to 32,000th of a second. You can access that all um, with the dial at the back when you're when you're in the T mode. So there are different ways of uh, of controlling it. I, I mean, I quite like it. You know, it's funny. It's a bit like if you drive in different countries uh, and people say, oh, how do you get on with the car? You know, I mean, it's a left-hand drive, right-hand drive, other side of the road. And it kind of, I, I just get on with it, you know? Um, I don't know if that's some kind of ambidextrous nature in my brain, but I don't I don't get so used to a past PASM camera that I find Fujifilm somehow difficult to use or vice versa. It, it kind of seems fairly natural to me. So I don't, I don't actually really have a preference. But as someone who does do quite a lot of long exposure work, I invariably have the Fujifilm cameras that I test set to T so that I can access exposures longer than one second. And as soon as you've done that, that you've locked the dial at the top and you're using a, a kind of digital dial on the back, then that kind of is bypassed that charm, hasn't it? Yes, yeah. The charm is gone. <laughs> now, the, the thrill is gone, yes. The thrill is gone. And we're left with just the same sadness as before. Um, now, the body it is a good looking body. Uh, I think it's a, a great looking camera, but you will notice that there is really very little grip to speak of on the front and no grip at the back. There's no thumb rest on the back. This for a chunky camera, there's surprisingly little to hold on to here. Now, on previous models, so Fujifilm uh, sold an optional accessory that you'd screw onto the bottom and it boosted the grip. They don't do that now for the F. The shell has changed a little bit, so it's not compatible. And as far as I understand, they're not going to be doing one. Um, of course, they may change their mind. Fortunately, there's a lot of third-party adapters available if you want to boost that grip. But I wanted to mention that, and I also wanted to mention that for all its size and weight and cost, this camera is not weatherproof. And to be fair, no other compact camera of this class is weatherproofed either but that doesn't excuse it i would like to see some weatherproofing on a, on a ca on a compact camera that costs over a thousand dollars i don't think that's unreasonable and i think considering how the x100f is designed as a street camera it's one that you can lit literally would take everywhere with you then it is going to confront a lot of different conditions it is going to be in the rain at some point you know uh, or by the beach it's going to see some splash and, and and dust and stuff so I, I would like to see some more confident ceiling in a future model as it is you know they're kind of using a lot of the shell from a previous body you know as such it still has it has a microphone input but it's 2.5 millimeter you know it does it'll take sd memory cards but they're only uhs one in terms of speed things like that you know what i mean they've not there's a few things that i feel could physically do with updating but i feel those are things that would go on to not a new generation of this camera but a completely new model like an x200 body rather than a fifth x100 that's that's my own feeling um because we're not going to talk about it too much more i'm going to mention two more things in this section of the video the first is that you can usb charge the battery which is nice although it does also come with an external ac adapter so that's the best of both worlds i also wanted to mention that it does have wi-fi the wi-fi implementation is pretty much exactly the same as say an xt20 an xt2 an x pro 2 you can remote control it effectively change the exposure remote trigger a movie you can touch to focus using your phone and of course you can you can move your phone around so that kind of gets over the fact it doesn't have an articulated screen but you can't tap to pull focus in movies sadly you can receive pictures over wi-fi of course and you can geotag your pictures but i'm going to mention something that i mentioned in our xt20 review which is for some bizarre reason the way the fujifilm geotagging solution works on its app is it takes the current location great uh, sends it to the camera as soon as you take the picture so it's already embedded as you take it great but then as you walk on to a new location, it doesn't update the position and it just continues to tag your subsequent pictures wherever you are with the old position, the position of the first one. It'll do this for up to an hour. So and I don't know about you. I mean, I, you know, we, we walk quite quickly. Mm -hmm. I was walking with Doug last week. You know, you can cover quite a lot of ground in an hour and every picture that you take, unless you switch this feature off, is tagged with the coordinates of the first one. And that sucks, doesn't it? I mean, that's not right. They know it's not right. I think they're going to change that but that's how it's right I, I wouldn't use it i just wouldn't use it with that situation i would i would use a totally separate mechanism for my gps tag 
yeah you would you would use a, a separate app to yeah. uh, record a log and apply it later and uh, that uh, opens up the question doug you've used an app for this before what do you use uh, I have settled on Galileo Offline Maps Pro because not only does it record uh, my uh, longitude and latitude and allow me to export those as a .gpx file, uh, but it also includes downloadable offline maps for anywhere I go in the world, and it is marvelous. So um, that's my that's my recommendation for today: Galileo Offline Maps Pro. Pro. It's got to be the pro because you're a professional. Yeah, the, the pro costs a few dollars and it includes features that you must have. I forget the difference between the pro and the non-pro, but the non-pro is sort of limited. It says pro. That makes you feel better about uh, it. That's right, because I'm a pro. Exactly. That's what I said. Yeah, so yeah. Um, now the now uh, there are APS-C fixed lens compacts out there. Fujifilm has one, the X70. Ricoh has one, the GR2. What makes the X100 series special is it's an APS-C sensor fixed lens compact with a viewfinder. And not just any viewfinder. This is a very cunning hybrid viewfinder that offers a kind of optical rangefinder type view and also an electronic type view. And you switch between them using that um, kind of uh, self-timer mechanism switch now that is a lever on the front that i pointed out earlier uh, so you would you would pull that to the side and it would switch between those two views now this is this is really 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 clever stuff it does add a lot to the price of this camera so you have to really want it if you don't want it or you don't think you'd use it then there are cheaper or different solutions available that might be better for you um but let's get into it so i'm gonna now um Rather than just describe, I'm going to show you what it looks like. And I, I held my my phone camera right up to the viewfinder of the X100F and started snapping away to show different views. So this first view that I'm going to show you uh, shows the uh, the optical rangefinder review on the left and the electronic view on the right. Now this is these are the same reproduced at the same size. So this shows you that they're kind of relative size as you look through the viewfinder. What you'll notice is that the optical view on the left is larger. Than the electronic view on the right but that's because it's showing stuff outside the frame now i've indicated the area of the frame you can see it with the, an alignment grid to make it more obvious and you can see that there's quite a lot of space around the edge and this is the key advantage of shooting with a rangefinder style optical viewfinder even more so than say a, a dslr because a dslr optical viewfinder or an electronic viewfinder just shows you what's going to be on the picture. It doesn't show you what's outside the picture. The reason what's outside the picture is it might be important is in a street type environment where you could have, I, I know a lot the way a lot of street photographers work is they find a really nice looking scene or really nice looking light and they think the only thing this picture needs is, is a person to walk in the middle of it. So I'm just going to wait here for the right person to walk in the middle of it. So you're stood there with your camera, you've got your composition worked out and you're waiting for the person to enter the frame. Well, with a rangefinder, you can see them coming into the frame before they've even hit the frame. So it gives you that kind of heads up. Um, so it gives you that kind of extra, extra warning. The other thing is that because it's a separate unit, it's not connected to the sensor. It's not connected to the, the lens in any way. So there's no blackout. When you take the picture, it doesn't black out. There's no lag or anything. So in fact, it's actually quite fun to follow action with it, uh, and shoot continuously because there's, you know, there's, there's no lag or blackout. Um, so I just want to talk to you, Doug, because you're really into street photography. Do you like using a rangefinder style camera for those reasons? Uh, very much so. I mean, uh, you know, I use my um, my Leica M cameras all the time for that. And it's exactly true. You know, it's like using a DSLR, except that you've got the, uh, like you say, the extra space around the image. And that really does help a lot. You just have to remember to use the frame guidelines and not assume that everything you see is going to end up on the image frame that's something to remember uh, yeah and fujifilm makes this re yeah and fuji makes it really easy for you because as you can see in in this view it can actually overlay a ton of graphics mm -hmm. on here not only does it show you uh, the frame which is indicated by that rectangle you can uh, overlay an alignment grid you can see your exposure information compensation you can overlay a live histogram there's all manner of information, but the really cool thing is because this is a kind of digital overlay, it can actually move the position, the framing to, uh, to, to compensate for parallax. So when you focus on something that's closer to you, you'll see that 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 frame actually shifts. And then when you focus back to, say, infinity or something further away, you'll see it shift again. Uh, so that's that's very, very neat. 
But if you prefer to see, you know, the complete view and you want a preview of white balance or any effects, the film simulations that Fujifilm offers, uh, because, of course, this camera has the full range of them, including Acros because it's X-Trans 3. So you've got that lovely high contrast monochrome. Then uh, you can switch to the electronic view. And I'm going to show you another uh, image here. So on the left, we've this is both of the electronic views. So on the left, we've got a full electronic view. And what I've done now it, on the right hand side is show a magnified view. And as you can see, that magnified view fills the screen, fills the viewfinder rather, and allows me to, to focus very precisely or confirm very precisely. And there's some great manual focusing aids as well. You've got focus peaking, you've got magnification. You've also got this um, kind of split screen simulation as well, which is reminiscent of old uh, um Again, film SLRs, well, it doesn't have to be a film SLR, old focusing screens where the part of the image would kind of slide over the top of, of another part of the image. And then when you lined them up, you knew it was in focus. It was just another way of doing it. They can now simulate this digitally. So you have that electronic uh, view if you want it. But here's the super clever bit. If that wasn't clever enough, if we go back to that optical rangefinder view, there is this this new, well, it's not new, it's newish kind of hybrid option. Now you'll notice in the bottom right hand corner of the optical view you can just see the lens poking out that's kind of normal on a rangefinder view but it makes that that area of the viewfinder a bit redundant so fujifilm had an idea and they went well you know what i wonder if there's any way that we could actually use that corner to peek at the electronic viewfinder panel and just use that as like a kind of mini version of something so They've now got this hybrid view, which uh, gives you the full optical image, but uses the bottom right hand corner to give a little window into the electronic viewfinder. And this is used mostly to provide um, kind of a magnified view of the focusing area for confirmation. But new to the X100F, you can actually choose different levels of magnification, including viewing the whole image if you want. Uh, and there's two kind of close-up views. This is exactly the same as on the X-Pro2. And you, and kind of Fuji diehards will also maybe notice that they've moved the uh, graphics and the exposure information around the optical viewfinder a bit uh, compared to the X100T, and it's to match the X-Pro2. So again, if you go from the X-Pro2 to the X100F, even everything in the viewfinder will look the same. The controls the same, stuff in the viewfinder will look the same. So it's a very natural, very natural switch. So this is... This is the big, the big, big thing about the X100 series, this hybrid viewfinder, the rangefinder view, the electronic view and the rangefinder with the with the kind of electronic window in the corner. And again, that's what makes this camera unique. That's what makes it more expensive than compact cameras, which only have an electronic viewfinder. So you've got to really want to use it. Now, when I use the X100 series, I marvel at this technology every time I go, oh, this is amazing. I love it. And I take my pictures and then I switch it off and I just shoot electronically because that's what I'm used to. I'm not a street shooter. This isn't the camera for me. So I'm going to throw this over to you, Doug. You are a street shooter. This camera is much more aimed at you than it is at me. Would you would you use this? Would you switch between them? Would you mostly use the optical view? Which which one would you prefer? And would it be a buying decision for you? Uh, I'm not sure it would be a buying decision. I I think I would tend to use the hybrid mode. Uh, you know, the, the I would use the electronics. Put it that way. Um, I I don't think I would go purely rangefinder. Uh, I think the the rangefinder cameras I have are excellent rangefinder cameras. I still think this is somewhat of a compromise, but I do like the digital overlay and all the advantages you get from that. It is super clever and it's great fun to show people it and they yeah. go, Oh, look at that. Wow. That's, that's really neat. But you've got to, you've got to really, really want it. Um, so that's that. I mean, and then just briefly, yes, you can compose with a screen, but it's not touch sensitive. It's fixed in place. It's like the X pro two. It's a camera that's designed, you, you know, the engineers, when you say to them, uh, cause I've spoken to the Fujifilm engineers a lot about them and, and when you say, oh, the screen, you know, it's not touch sensitive, it doesn't tilt. And you see their, see their faces <laughs> kind of crumple a bit and they're like, and then you say, yeah, but that's because it's an eye level camera. You're supposed to use the viewfinder. And they go, yes, yes, that's it. That's right. That's how you're supposed to use this camera. Yeah. So, you know, it is quite a specialist product. You know, it's not it's not a real general kind of camera. And it is designed like the X-Pro2 to be used up to your face you know, with eye level composition, in which case it works brilliantly. Yeah, the big, the big, the big change is the joystick. Yes, yeah, and that and that makes things much. Yeah, better, I mean, that, you know, so it, a lot of what you might want a touch sensitive screen for, which is to reposition the focus point, for example, mm. the joystick is there, and I find that perfectly easy to use. 
yeah it, it works it works really well um and as i say it falls directly under your thumb which is really nice now let's move on to the lens this is something that hasn't changed across the generations it's a 23 millimeter f2 lens now remember it's an aps-c sensor so you got the 1.5 times field reduction blah 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 it is a 35 millimeter equivalent focal length now as doug and i discuss this we're going to show you some photos that uh that i've taken with it um while I was testing the camera to kind of show the flexibility of it, because what the, the first concern you have is it's a fixed lens. There's no zoom on this. This is the focal length you've got. There's some teleconverters I'll mention in a minute, but really you've got to be at peace with it being 35 millimeters. So the first thing you want to kind of find out is what can you use that for? So, I mean, Doug, what do you think of the 35 millimeter focal length? If you were only going to have one focal length, is that okay? Yeah. I, surprisingly, 35 used to be what I thought was just about perfect, but now with Leica Q, the Ricoh GR, I've gone even wider to 28. So that's you know strictly for a street for street photography scenario. But I think that uh, 35 is probably perfect for someone getting started in street photography. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I guess one of the benefits of a 28 would be with a high resolution sensor is you could always crop it. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, the concern with 28 is that it could arguably be a bit wide for a lot of things, but you can crop it. Whereas if you crop a 35, it just becomes longer. You know, you get a narrow, narrow field of view. Uh, but still, it is remarkably flexible. You know, you can shoot. Uh, I used it for food photography. You know, I shot lots of snacks and coffees and burgers and things. You can use it for landscapes, for kind of portraits. You're looking more kind of waist up type portraits if you get too close if you try and do a head and shoulders there's going to be some distortion because you're a bit close you know actually i've got a i've got a photo of you doug in our sample images with one of your uh, semi-portable uh, <laughs> five by four inch cameras yeah and a fine a fine looking gentleman you are with that wonderful piece of gear if you want to see doug's portable camera head over to the sample images at cameralabs.com it's a a sight to behold hmm. yeah it's my my totally non-electronic camera yeah not exactly. A, not a single exactly. not a single battery in it no, really. So yeah, you have a separate metering. So there's no ISO dial on that, is there? No, no. I mean, there's there's nothing. Right. So you've seen what you can shoot at 35 millimeter. If you fancy something slightly wider or longer, there are two lens adapters, kind of teleconverter type things available. There's one that applies 0.8 times for 28 mil equivalent, uh, or 1.4 times for kind of like a 50 mil equivalent, and you can use the adapters for previous x100 bodies but they've done version 2 models of these which are backwards compatible but if you mount them on the x100f you no longer need to go into a menu and say by the way i fitted this adapter lens it it knows they electronically communicate this is one of the new features but you know i would argue that if you are really seriously thinking about getting both of these teleconverters then perhaps you should probably be thinking about getting an xt20 or even an x pro 2 and, uh, and just using interchangeable lenses with it instead. Yeah, the, the, whole, also... the whole point of this camera is that it's completely self-contained. You know, you don't have any extra parts. And so once you start adding those converters, like you say, why not go to interchangeable lenses? But that, I have to sneak in my one pet peeve here, Gordon. I know I'm getting us off track, but you know what it is. Why does this camera have a removable lens cap? I don't know why at, after f four generations, they can't have an electric uh, cover for that lens because that thing is you know you want to put a camera in a pocket or nearly in a pocket you don't want to have an extra thing in your hand so can you get your rx100 point it at the camera and switch it on so we can see how quick the process between pressing the power button and it being ready for action okay, is? okay here we go you ready and yeah. go okay so less than a second yeah. and you'll notice that there is a little cover an automatic cover of course we've all seen them before it slides out of the way when you power it on and it slides back again when it's uh, when it's off now of course you can stick your thumb through it um but you know they're, they're not they're not very strong and that's the first thing i should say the first pro of a proper plastic or even a metal lens cap is that they're, they're tough you know, you're not going to get, once it's on, you're not going to get any, uh, you know, it's very hard to damage the lens behind it, but you do have to take it on and off. And every time I say this to people uh, that it's an inconvenience, they look at me as if this is a real, this is even a first world problem. This is a ridiculous, <laughs> it's like, you know, the problem with my hat is I have to take it off and put it on again. You know, that's the downside to my hat. And they go, what on earth are you talking about? The downside to your hat is you have to take it off when you're hot and you put it on when you're cold. That's stupid. But 
you know, when you're when you're in a street type environment and you've seen like this amazing looking person or amazing looking light and it's changing fast, you whip the camera. You've it. There is, you know, you're going to take at least a second, maybe two seconds to take that lens cap off and maybe put it in a pocket or put it down. That's quite a long time in a spontaneous situation. So there are pros and cons to this. I mean, that's what you're talking about, Doug, isn't it? Is yeah. it is it the fact that you're worried about losing it or worried about losing? It's, the moment well, it's or just both? I don't want to have an extra thing. It's, it's, you know, I take the RX100, I take it out of my camera and it's all I have to worry about. I don't have to take off the cap. I don't have to worry. Put the lens cap. You know, here's another camera. This is the Ricoh GR2, uh, which mm. we've, you, you mentioned briefly, but look, it's even faster. Ready, set, go, right? That's it. It's less than mm. half a second to open and close that thing. Um, and that's APS-C as well. It's APS-C. Uh, mm. By the way, it's less than half the price of the X100F. Mm. So, it doesn't have a viewfinder. It doesn't though. have a viewfinder. You're right. No, uh, but it's and it's 16 megapixel, I believe. But it's uh, you know it's an APS-C fixed lens, 28 mil equivalent, I think, uh, compact with a sliding lens cover and quite a nice black and white uh, JPEG. Uh, well, color, isn't it? color too, but the, the the black and whites are extraordinarily good. Yeah. Yeah, so let's. I'm going to keep talking about the lens because yeah, there's yeah. quite a few things to lenses, mention. Lenses. So that's one of the downsides for Doug is that you can't take the cap off, and he's a busy man. He doesn't have time to take the cap off. So you know this is an important factor for me. A real major downside to the X100 series is that the lens isn't stabilized, and neither is the sensor. Now this isn't so much of a problem for stills because you just choose a faster shutter speed. And the nice thing is, I mean, it's got auto ISO uh, a very good auto ISO mode on it so I just set a minimum shutter speed interestingly um, for a 35 mil unstabilized equivalent lens you should probably be able to hand hold it you know easily at 35th 40th 50th of a second and the default is 60th for, for the auto ISO but I found quite a lot of camera shake I don't know whether I was particularly tired or fired up on coffee but personally speaking I, I had to actually increase it to 125th of a second for the minimum the minimum shutter speed but it's easily done so you can resolve that and you know there's no argument that I used to say as in you know it's great for easier composing at telephoto focal lens you know that you can keep that image nice and steady because it's not a telephoto system even with the teleconverter on it's only 50 mil so that's not a point either but it is for video now an unstabilized system for video is horrible um, and I, I find that a, a real limiting factor on this camera. Of course, the Fuji engineer's face will again crumple until you say, but I appreciate this isn't a camera for video. And then you cheer up again, go, oh, yes, you're right. It's not a camera that's for video shoot. We'll shoot video, but it's not designed for them. So I just want to get that out of the way. It's not a stabilized system. Um, perhaps another issue, though, so I've got a few issues with the lens is it will focus as close as 10 centimeters, which is pretty close, but it becomes very soft, very soft when you do that. So here's a picture. Um, now, Doug was recently in Belgium. So here's a picture of uh, one of my favorite Belgian beers. It's a Trappist beer, a Rochefort 10, one of my top three. If you're interested in that, if you'd uh, like Doug and I to record an episode of All About the Beer, then uh, let us know in the comments and we'll uh, look into that for you. So uh, Rochefort 10, great beer. Look at that label, though. That label upon which I was focused using the AF joystick lever, it's not very sharp, is it? It's a bit kind of fuzzy around the edges. That's very disappointing. So I'm going to show you um, three crops. Now, these are 100% crops. And on the left, here it is at F2 in the middle, F2.8, and on the right, F4. And you can see that it really has to be close to F4 before that becomes sharp at close range. And to me, that's that's a bit... It's a bit sad. It limits its functionality. Again, the engineer's face crumples until you say, but of course, it's not a macro camera. I understand. It's a street camera. And to illustrate that, here's two photos. The one on the left was taken by Mr. Doug K. It is in the uh, wonderful brunch uh, diner of Mamas on Washington Square in San Francisco, one of my favorite places in the world. We went there for a lovely, uh, lovely lunch uh, the other day. And on the right is a picture of a deck chair in uh, Brighton, uh, where I live. And both of them are taken at F2. This time, the subject is about a mm, meter, two meters away. And you'll see it's nice and sharp now. And again, this tells you more about what the camera is designed for. You know, it's designed to take it will deliver sharp images at F2, but not if they're really close up. So for food, kind of like lifestyle, Instagram type food photography, where you really get close to a plate, it's not going to be great. 
and I've got lots of examples of this in my sample images at cameralovs.com. Um, you, you, I encourage you to download them and look at them. You'll see they're not they're not pin sharp and crisp in the same way that they are when you've got a more distant subject. So if you're thinking, hey, this camera is going to be really good to document my kind of for my food blog, it's probably not the ideal camera for that. So th those are my kind of disappointments with it, you know, I think and I think and I should also say, yeah, so the autofocus has improved because it's driven by the new sensor. You know, the new sensor's got a much better phase detect AF system over a much broader area it is faster than before. But like all Fujifilm cameras, and in fact, all, like all cameras, it's very much limited by the lens in front of it. And this lens is not the fastest focuser in the world. It can be quite leisurely. So what I would like to see in a new generation of this body is a lens that focuses faster that is stabilized or that the sensor is stabilized and also that um that is that is you know sharper at close range i'm happy with f2 i'm not looking for one that's f1.4 1.8 i think two is nice you know it could be worse it could be 2.8 right uh but I want it to be foot to perform better at close focusing distance. I want it to be stabilized. I want it to focus faster. And and we'll have dugs in there as well. How about an electronic sliding lens cover? What do you think? I think that would be marvelous because uh, the big question is, is the X100F the end of the line for the X100 series or not? But there mm -hmm. is still a room for improvement. I agree with you about the lens. I think that's the uh, the, the place they should spend it. I'm not, personally... I'm not concerned about the image stabilization because I'm shooting at higher shutter speeds regardless. But uh, I would like a, a, an improved, improved lens for when I do get close in particular. And speaking of video, because again, this is not a camera that's designed for video. So it's not surprising that even though the sensor and the image processor are capable of recording 4K, it doesn't. On the X100F, it's the same as the X-Pro2. It is 1080p at up to 60p alone. And the clips are also up to only 15 minutes in length. They won't even do a half-hour 1080p clip. So, you know, this is not, you know, it's not a camera, you know, if you've got the, it doesn't have 4K, it doesn't have any kind of stabilization, it doesn't have a touch screen, it doesn't have a completely flat profile, it'll only record 15 minutes. You know, it's um, it's not a video it's not a ca video camera. When you consider that the RX100 Mark V has also got phase detect AF and it's got um, 4K video and half hour. No, it hasn't got half hour clips, has it? But the Panasonic one does. Or does it? Cool, I've caught myself out there in a <laughs> trap because I know I think the Sony might only be 10 minutes. Look at my review. I've written it in my review. I've got momentary blank there. Um, it's definitely written in my review. Some of them have got shorter clips in 4K, maybe only 10 minutes, but certainly they'll do half an hour of 1080 which the x100f won't do so that's a bit disappointing and i know the fuji engineer would say yes but it's not designed for video but i would say yes but it can do it you know why take it out if it can do it and the x-pro2 took it out because for market reasons you know not not to drive sales to the xt2 but because they don't feel that the people who buy it would be interested in it but i'm sure there are occasional weirdos like me who you know everything about this camera they love but they wish it would do that and if that stops me from buying it that's a silly decision i think technically it can do it you know you might with 4k a lot of the problem is that the camera isn't big enough to dissipate the heat well i, th I think this camera probably is big enough to dissipate the heat you know, and it's got a fair sized battery. So, you know, I, I could co I could handle the fact if it burns through the battery quickly or got warm. I'd just like to have the capability. You know, it can do it. The sensor can do it. The processor can do it. But, you know, it's not designed for it. So you can't have if you want 4K, this isn't the camera for you. Again, this takes me back to the X-T20. The X-T20 does have a touch screen. It has an articulated screen. It can film 4K, although only for 15 minutes it'll do. 1080 for longer but um you know it um it could be you know if you are into video and you want the fujifilm sensor then the xt20 is is probably the way to go or the xt2 if you've you know you want a weatherproof body and all the rest of it the, the bigger viewfinder so you've got to think about all of these now before i move on there's a very important thing to mention um about the lens it uh, the shutter is in the lens it is a leaf shutter a mechanical shutter this is a key benefit or difference that the x100 series has over interchangeable lens models which typically have focal plane shutters. And this is of particular importance if you're into flash light photography, which I'm not. So if you are, um, you should be uh, checking out sites like Chris Gampat's The Foblographer. He's, he's my flash guy, literally, to look into. But I can tell you that on most interchangeable lens cameras, your fastest flash sync is typically 1 over 180 or 1 over 250. On this camera, it's 
between a thousandth and two thousandth of a second, I believe, depending on the aperture value. That may or may not be 100% correct, but either way, it's at least four times faster, at least four times faster than a typical focal plane model. And that's brilliant if you're into flash photography. And also, it's very, very quiet. It also has an electronic shutter that's completely silent, but the mechanical shutter on it, this leaf shutter, is super duper duper quiet. So it's a very discreet camera, and that's uh, again a really nice benefit for uh, street. Do you, do you have much experience with leaf shutters, Doug? Oh yeah, because my uh, Leica Q has a leaf shutter. Um, a number of the cameras do, and, and we should explain what's going on with this. The you know when you use flash, obviously the the uh, the sensor has to be fully exposed when the flash goes off. And in the case of a focal plane shutter, because it's sliding vertically or horizontally, depending on uh, what you've got there, um, there are moments, there, the, the period in which the shutter is fully open at all parts of the, uh, sorry, the sensor is fully uh, exposed is a relatively short period of time. With the, um, w with the shutter in the lens, uh, it basically opens and closes and so you have the whole um, sensor exposed, so you get to take shutter speed. Now, why is that important? That's because if you're trying to balance daylight and flash, and you want to darken the natural light exposure, you can go to the higher shutter speeds and still preserve your flash exposure. So when you're doing hybrid shots of daylight and flash, that's where these um, higher shutter speeds for sync make a big difference. Well, I'm glad you explained that. That's fantastic. Doug is, in fact, your man uh, for flash and leaf photography information. He's the man you should be asking. Brilliant. Well, I'm, I'm glad we've got you here, Doug. This is this is perfect. I would say we pretty much wrapped up this camera, and it's time to talk about comparing it to other products to see whether one may or may not be more suitable than another. Because I still feel the holy grail for a lot of photographers, including myself, is a high-quality compact camera. Ultimately, that's what I want. You know, I mean, I love swapping lenses and, and doing, you know, the really creative stuff. But there are times when you want to carry something smaller, but you still want good quality. So you want a small camera that's got the features and the quality and you're willing to give up a couple of things. Different people are willing to give up different things, like maybe they're willing to give up uh, a zoom lens, maybe they're willing to give up video performance, maybe they're willing to give up stabilization, or maybe they're willing to give up a viewfinder. So we've all got different things. So what I want is going to be different to what you want, but you've got to think about this really carefully. So we've got a really eclectic selection to compare it to here. I'm going to start again with that Sony RX100 Mark V. So let's say, before anything else, remind us, how much does the X100F cost? The X100F is $1,300 in the U.S., and how much is the previous model, the X100T? Interestingly, it's discontinued at B&H, but you can still find it at Amazon for $200 less. It's not a, ma not a massive difference, actually. And if we, again, just remind ourselves of those differences, it's mainly the sensor and the controls. So the uh, it's on the X100T, it's the 16 megapixel X-Trans 2. On the X100F, it's the 24 megapixel X-Trans 3. And X-Trans 3 also has that broader phase detect area, which is nice to have. And it also supports things like Acros, that nice black and white uh, process. And I think also in some way the grain simulations and things like that are tied into the latest processor as well. So you gain those image quality differences. You also get the AF joystick, the ISO dial, the front dial. But the lens, essentially the body and the viewfinder are the same so if you like the sound of that an APS-C sensor with a fixed 35 mil equivalent lens and that hybrid viewfinder you can have that on the x100t that's not massive amount of differences so that's your first option now let's look at something uh, completely different uh, the sony rx100 mark 5 how much does that cost uh, that's a thousand dollars so you save three hundred dollars compared to the x100f Okay, so most obviously it's smaller in every dimension. It is genuinely pocketable. Um, it will cause a bit of a bulge in your pocket, but it is it will squeeze in there. It's almost half the weight, significantly lighter. It has a zoom lens, only a three times zoom lens, but a zoom lens nonetheless. So instead of fixed 35, it's now, uh, well, it's not a three times zoom. What we're talking about is two point something. It's 24 to 70, isn't it? And most important, uh, it has the tilt screen. That's yes. That's a huge difference. Not only tilt, it goes all the way to face the subject, doesn't it? It does. There you yeah, go. so you can use it for uh, for vlogging, for self portraits. You can't do that with uh, with the X one hundred F. It's um, you know it's a completely different type of product. Um, it'll also film four K video. It does, however, 
only have a one inch sensor it's a small significantly smaller sensor than APS-C 20 uh, megapixels as well slightly lower res now of course you might think well you know that is a smaller sensor it's not going to be as good at high ISOs but um well it's certainly fractionally brighter at the wide end uh, at the wide end so you're going to f1.8 so you're going to get a tiny benefit there but on the whole you're going to get better low better high ISO performance out of the x100f yeah, and but that, and that that's only at the widest angle. Once you start to zoom yeah. in, you lose that wide uh, lens aperture. Yeah, it slows down to f2.8, doesn't it? Yeah. So at the long end, uh, you've lost a stop in light gathering, and you've still got that smaller sensor behind it. So in that scenario, it's going to be using the Sony's going to be using a much higher ISO than the Fujifilm um, with you know higher noise levels as a result. But equally, it's got a 70 millimeter frame at that point rather than the 35 millimeter frame. So. That's where you got to weigh up. So to me, the Sony is a much more flexible camera. Oh, yeah, it has a, a, a pop-up viewfinder that's electronic only. It's not this clever hybrid kind of optical thing, but uh, still, it's uh, it, it has it, and that's pretty neat. Now, if you're after an interchangeable lens camera, because that's something else you might want to consider, a small interchangeable lens camera, we looked at the beginning of this review at the Lumix GX800 or GX850. How much is one of those, Doug? Uh, with the 12 to 35 millimeter kit lens, uh, it's $550. So it's $750 less than the X100F. Yeah, 12 to 32 probably. 12, on that. and that's, what did I say? Uh, 12 to 35. 12 to 32, you're correct. Yeah, and that's a two times field reduction on that. So that becomes a 24 to uh, 64 millimeter. So again, you've got the zoom on your side. Now it's a much slower lens. It's 3.5 to 5.6. The center is micro four thirds. So it's bigger than one inch, but still not as big as APS-C. So you've got that smaller aperture and smaller sensor disadvantage, right? Mm -hmm. So that so it is going to be using higher ISOs, so unless, you know, you put a, a brighter lens on it. And that's the first benefit that it has over the X100F and the RX100 from Sony is that you can change the lenses on this. You can put whatever you want on it. Flexibility you may or may not want. Uh, it will also film 4K video. Uh, it has a touch screen. It has, it has a lot, you know. It's, um, it's, it's a nice budget interchangeable lens camera and we've done a big review of that if that's something that interests you. And it's so much cheaper and it's smaller. You know, it's a lot smaller and light, too. So that's something worth considering. Now, you might go, yeah, but, you know, I, I want the APS-C sensor. I want the Fujifilm quality. So in that case, let's have a look at Fujifilm's range. Their smallest interchangeable lens camera is the X-T20. How much is an X-T20? Uh, the body's 850, and if you get the 23mm f2, it's another 450. So you're looking at $1,300. As we said earlier, the exact same price as an X-100F. So in that case, you've kind of turned the X-T20 into an, an X-100F, kind of, at least in terms of coverage. So you've got the same focal length lens, the same focal ratio. Because it's an interchangeable lens, it's going to stick out more than it does on the X-100F. The clever thing about the X-100 series, because it is a fixed lens, they can build some of the elements into the body. So that lens actually continues quite significantly into the body itself, and that's what allows it to be relatively thin. You know, in comparison, the X-T20, which is not a big camera to start with, once you put that 23mm f2 lens on it, it's actually twice the thickness. So it is quite significantly thicker, but it's an interchangeable lens camera. You can put any lens you want on it. It has a tilting touch screen. It will film 4K video. Um, you know, it doesn't have that optical hybrid viewfinder, but it does have a good electronic viewfinder. So different things to weigh up again i think it's probably a better general purpose camera but not as pocketable and you miss out on that optical viewfinder it's also worth kind of mentioning again the uh, the ricoh gr2 and the um fujifilm x70 uh, both older models but you have the prices on them i've got the gr2 it's uh, six hundred dollars right so that's like half the price that's like half the price and i think the x70 would be roughly similar yeah aps-c sensor uh, lower resolution, so fatter pixels, although an older older technology as well. But, you know, still the quality is going to be nice on it. Fixed lens. So you don't have the flexibility of the zoom. You don't have a viewfinder on either of those uh, models. Uh, but, you know, they're smaller and they're cheaper. As I said earlier on in the review, unless you went off very wisely to make a cup of tea or pour a beer, the X70 possibly won't get an upgrade to X-Trans 3 due to power and or heat limitations so don't 
don't hold back for that thinking that that's going to happen. I apologize if it does. If you've watched this video six months down the line and, and you're holding an X80 in your hands with an X Trans 3, I apologize in advance, but I'm pretty sure that's the case. I don't think they're going to be able to do it. That's that's what I've been led to believe, which is a shame because it would be nice to have that in a smaller body. So as it stands, if you want the smallest Fuji film, is the X70 with the old generation sensor. If you want the latest generation sensor, the smallest Fuji film is the X100F. Now, when talking about all of these cameras, the one difference, because there's lots of differences to where the one difference that keeps coming back again and again and again is that optical hybrid viewfinder. That viewfinder which can switch between optical and electronic views. And even in the optical view, it's got that optional overlay in the bottom right corner. So that's what it that's what it's really all about, you know. Um, do you want it? I know I've said this before, but you've got to ask yourself, do you want it? Is it worth paying for it? If you don't think you'd use it, or if it's, you know, is it worth paying for it just to show off in the pub to your friends, you know, to show them it, this may not be the model for you. And again, you know, if you're looking for a great general purpose model, this isn't going to be it either. First of all, it doesn't have the flexibility of a zoom, but even the lens that it does have is not good at close range. So it really is. This is a specialist camera. You know, when you use it in the environment that it's designed for as a street camera, it's magnificent. It's quiet. It's smallish. It handles very, very quickly. Um, the lens is the perfect focal length. The viewfinder, whether you're using the optical rangefinder or the try, it gives you that flexibility to work however you want and switch seamlessly between them. The quality is lovely. JPEG straight out of camera from Fujifilm, as we know, are very, very good. So use it as it was meant to be used. Surprise, surprise, use something as it's meant to be used and it works well. But it does. It's a specialist tool and it works brilliantly for street photographers. But I don't think it is a great general purpose camera. And if I, um, since I'm not a street photographer myself, I found uh, some of it uh, quite restrictive. But Doug, you are a street photographer. So is this a camera that appeals to you? It, it does very much. I, I want to give sort of a perspective for street photography in, in particular. You know, one of the high-end street photography cameras is the Leica Q. I have it here. So this is a camera that costs more than $4,000. Uh, it doesn't, uh, unusual for Leica, it does not have a rangefinder. It has an electronic viewfinder. It is a marvelous, marvelous camera with controls quite similar to Fuji in that there's no PASM dial. But this is one of my absolute favorite cameras. The X100F is essentially this camera, although it has an APS-C viewfinder that Leica has a full frame, but it's one quarter the price of this camera. And I dare say it's much better than one quarter the quality. So the X100F is terrific. But uh, we've also mentioned this Ricoh GR, which is one of the world's best kept secrets. It hasn't been updated in forever. Uh, but it, it is a marvelous camera that is, again, less than half the price of even the X100F. So there you have three cameras, all with non-interchangeable, non-zoom lenses that in each of their own ways is ideal for street photography, but you're ranging from seven hundred, sorry, $600 to over $4,000. Mm. Like you said, none of these is a good general purpose camera. These are cameras mm. for street photography. That means it's likely to be the second camera, it might be the first camera, but it's one of more than one camera that anybody listening or watching this podcast is going to go for. So if mm. you want a camera that's dedicated to street, X100F, I think, is perfect in the middle. Um, if, you're in, if you're willing to forego the electronic viewfinder and... Uh, find both the the good and the bad quirkiness of something like this. The Ricoh GR2 is great. And if you have way too much money, get a Leica Q. Yeah, or a Sony RX1 R Mark II as well, another full-frame fixed lens yeah. uh, compact. That's quite expensive, but, you know, it is out there. I mean, the, again, if you're an X-Pro2, if you love the X-Pro2, but want it in a smaller form, then the X100F is the camera for you. And equally, it would appeal to people who already have an X-Pro2, but don't want to carry it out all the time, want a kind of discrete backup. The controls and the quality and everything, the menus, it's all exactly the same. So you'll get to get to grips with it straight away. And that's who it's really aimed at. You know, it's aimed at people who either want it as a companion to an X-Pro2 or want it instead of an X-Pro2 because they want a smaller or, or cheaper version of it. So it's a specialist, but if you are that kind of specialist, you'll, you'll love it. And even though I'm not that kind of specialist, I still loved shooting with it. And I would say also, I really loved shooting with uh, Mr. Doug K all day. Uh, I effectively kind of went on a street photography workshop with him um, by accident. We uh, we were shooting together and as we were doing it, he was pointing out lots of things that I hadn't noticed about the lighting, composition, where people would be. And I thought, you know what, 
it would be really cool to you know do do more photo uh, kind of workshops and tutorials with him and of course you do offer that and if you're interested in shooting with doug go to dougk.com and find out when his uh, next session is because i really enjoyed it and i felt he raised my game raised my street game very much so thank you for that doug. very good and uh, if you're interested in the fuji x100f or any of the cameras or lenses that we review here at cameralabs.com go to cameralabs.com click on the buy now button because the affiliate revenues that we earn put coffee in our in our bellies or beer as the case may be and keeps food on the table so please do that also look over gordon's shoulder there his left shoulder camera right is a book entitled in camera uh this is this is a, a gem this book my, my wife picked it up because i had it in the bathroom <laughs> i shouldn't say that uh she said i had no idea gordon was such a good photographer uh these are beautiful images and I love the idea, especially being a street photographer, we don't, where we don't do much post. Uh, these are really mostly travel shots, I'd call them. They're gorgeous, but it proves proves what you can do without any sub, uh, significant post-processing. I encourage you to take a look at it. It's a great book, Gordon. Thank you very much, Doug. I, I really appreciate you saying that. And it's better to say thanks to your wife as well. Now get it out of your bathroom. It's not the poo yeah, book, no, 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 it? no. Well, you know, it's there's a lot to read, oh. so you sort of, oh. never mind. I'm going to, way too much detail. Uh, yeah, but um, also, please remember, do go to cameralabs.com and buy us a cup of coffee because these podcasts are early in the morning for me and any chance I have for more coffee. Just trying to keep up with Mr. Gordon Lang is much appreciated. Thank you very much. Well, as always, it's been a pleasure. If you've stayed to the end of this uh, video podcast, thanks for sticking with us. And uh, as always, you, you know where to find us if you want more of the same. Let us know what you think, and we'll see you next time. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.